Hello, my name is Pedro Moreira. I would like to give a warm welcome to all of you joining us today to this uh, Medina on air session from Escola Superior de Música de Lisboa in Lisbon, Portugal. Medina on air, as you know, is an online project supported by the Erasmus Plus program. And with us today, we have professors Luis Tinoco and Carlos Caires, composers and teachers at the ESML uh, composition department. And uh, they will uh, approach the topic artistic identity within the Portuguese contemporary music scene. So I give you the floor, Luis. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everyone. I thank uh, Pedro and all the team organizing these sessions uh, for this kind invitation. And um, uh, I would like, before I start, uh, presenting um, some examples and talking about the subject itself, itself I would like just to clear um, that um, my relation um, with this session today is divided in different layers. In a way, as Pedro mentioned, I'm one of the teachers here at this uh, Escola Superior de Musica. Um, I'm also a composer, but I'm also um, uh, an active uh, collaborator with the public radio, with the public classical radio in Portugal. Uh, so I've been doing um, radio programs for uh, more than 20 years now, and um, most especially focusing on new music and um, also focusing on the idea of uh, searching for a geography of sound. I actually have a weekly uh, radio program where I talk about new music being composed all around the world in the different continents uh, uh, for the most recent years. Um, and um, as part of that collaboration, I also um, usually take part in one event that is organized by various uh, public radios uh, called the International Composers Rostrum, uh, where I have the uh, luck and uh, uh, privilege to uh, listen to a lot of music being done by many composers uh, in different countries every year, very fresh music. Um, and this gives me um, uh, the ability to be in touch and to listen to many things happening, uh, different from the context of my own uh, bubble uh, here in this in this college. So uh, also I would like to start clearing one thing that can be a little tricky in the title that I gave to this session, uh, artistic identity within the Portuguese contemporary music scene. Um, I would like not to have this title confused with Portuguese identity within the contemporary music scene because it's two different things. What I'm interested in the first place is to think a bit a bit about what gives an artistic identity uh, to a composer. Uh, and of course, being a Portuguese composer related with this field of work here in our country, um, I'm going to focus in examples by some of my colleagues. Um, but what I'm really mainly interested to reflect on is the idea of artistic identity. Um, uh, and uh, so I will start raising a few questions. Uh, I'm not sure I have answers for all of them. Uh, the first one I, ever, I already mentioned, uh, uh, I often think about what gives the artistic identity to a composer. And of course, uh, elements of nationality among others, others can um, help to confer this identity, um, but not only. Uh, and um, this is an issue that is very interesting, interesting for me as a composer because the first time I was confronted with this uh, question was when I went abroad uh, to study. Um, and I remember being in a session like this one, uh, not <clears throat> via Zoom, but presential with people sitting next to each other. And um, someone asked me, uh, what was Portuguese in my music? And this is something that um, I was not prepared to, um, to answer because to be honest, I had never thought about that when, when I was still uh, a student composer. 
Um, and um, uh, so this is something I will get back to uh, later on, uh, but it's something that um, um, uh, I think that many times we are so many, so so much focused and concerned, worried to uh, find answers how, on how to choose notes, rhythms, uh, uh, or orchestrate, and so on, and we forget to think about things that are really very uh, important in the first place, uh, uh, namely what defines our own voice, uh, what do we have to say, and how much does the fact that we come from one country and not a different country affects in, in any way uh, the music uh, uh, that we want to make. Um, then um, uh, another question uh, that uh, I raise uh, and I confront myself many many times and also with my students um, is what 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 defines us as composers or what sets us apart uh, or what makes an artist unique uh, in the sense that I believe that everyone wants uh, or aims to find uh, a unique voice or not to be just um, in the middle of the crowd. Uh, uh, and this is also something that is very global. It's not a, <laughs> a, 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 an exclusively uh, Portuguese concern, I believe. Everyone thinks about this, uh, no matter where. Um, uh, also, bearing in mind that we are in um, a period of a, a extreme globalization, um, that also raises a question, how can we achieve ident ident identity uh, in these times of uh, global uh, culture uh, that is really taking over? And I think already took over, it's not taking over. And also within this globalization, uh, how can we uh, get around or avoid um, the power of some uh, centers of influence? Yeah, I don't. I don't mention these in a uh, critical way. I think it is absolutely normal that uh, some uh, um, areas within the globe, uh, because they are either economically very powerful or politically very influential, uh, they end up to also be very influential in uh, uh, deciding or uh, making uh, the path of what is the mainstream or what is the the the, um, the the main production or the the one that gets more visible and of course um within an european country uh, i think it can be consensual if we say that countries like germany or france for example are countries that are very influential and when i say how can composers in different countries countries get around these uh, this power or to avoid this uh, um, centripetal uh, power of these um, uh, centers it's not that it's not good what's happening there it's uh, uh, in, in the sense that one can be very easily um, trying to get um, in the same uh, path because uh, uh, even for young composers, for example, the expectation that by joining the the the, the, the trends that are more visible and more po powerful, probably that also will give room for uh, young composers and so on. So uh, sometimes for uh, countries that are a bit in the fringe, like my own, I believe that uh, 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 trying to be aware of what happens in these countries, but also trying to find other paths can be a solution to find this uh, individual and uniqueness. Um, also, and this now brings me to my radio experience um, uh, in search for geographies of sounds. Um, um, uh, I, I, I think that um, uh, uh, that gives me, as, as I said before, the, the, the capacity or the possibility to observe certain phenomena. And for example, something that is very evident for me is what I normally call the exiled composers. Um, and uh, exiled composers in the sense that probably they don't live in their own country, so they went to a different country and they absorb the culture of the place that, where they are. 
uh, or they keep living in their own countries, but they are very much influenced by the voice of other countries. Um, and uh, in that sense, they are living in their own country, but they are also exiled somehow in the sense that they are um, making music as if they would be abroad. Um, for example, uh, uh, when I uh, broadcast music by Asian composers and I read their biographies, um, uh, it's very interesting that many of them, either if they are South Korean, Japanese, Chinese, from Taiwan, whatever, uh, many times they define as themselves as Western composers in their biographies. Um, probably because many of them went to Europe or to the United States to do their post-degree studies in composition, but it is a fact that many of them don't describe them as uh, Oriental or Asian composers. They describe themselves as Western composers. Uh, even in my own country uh, or other countries, it's not very difficult to find uh, composers writing music that can sound French, German, American, whatever. So this is uh, uh, something that um, I'm bringing to the discussion um, as an observation, not necessarily as a criticism. Um, but on the other hand, I think that there are some elements um, always, or maybe uh, very often they uh, end up coming to the surface. Uh, even when this outside influence is, is, is very strong. Uh, for example, I mentioned Asian composers. Uh, one thing I find with uh, uh, many of the uh, Asian music that I uh, um, get familiar with is that aspects like instrumentation, uh, color, uh, timbre, but also poetry, philosophy, mythology, meditation, uh, contemplation, a uh, sense of uh, long or a circular time. It's something that uh, uh, they can be using techniques that they took from uh, Western tradition, but many of these elements come to the surface. And uh, this is where I think that the, 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 the matter of uh, identity starts to reveal itself. Uh, um, uh, we can think of composers like uh, Toro Takemitsu, of course. We, sometimes it's an extremely Western composers, composer. Sometimes he's a, 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 an extremely Oriental composer. Uh, or uh, Isang Yun, Unzuk Chin, uh, Toshi Ozokawa, Tandun. Well, there, there's so many of these composers. I think we can find uh, some of these ele elements that I've mentioned in their music. Um, but then, for example, if I go to countries from the Baltic, uh, um, and, and again, this is not something like a receipt that you can find in every of these composers, but uh, one thing I, I, I identify a lot in many composers coming from Baltic countries is um, uh, modalism, uh, spirituality, transcendence, devotion, again, tone color, timbre, and in an orchestration where we, we find a lot of pieces written for strings, string orchestras, vocal music, choirs. And of course, I'm thinking of composers like Arvo Part, Toivo Tulev, uh, Elena Tulve, uh, Pavel Szymanski, Eric Eschenfalz, there are so many of them. So it's um, uh, something that really, uh, Sometimes just by listening to the music, even not knowing the name of the composers, we can identify this identity. Uh, or if we come uh, to another country, a small country like Holland, for example, uh, then many times I identify things that are very different from all of these that I've said, like speed, uh, energy, uh, multiculturalism, uh, contamination in the sense that uh, uh, music within the written tradition can all of a sudden blend with rock, jazz, gambling music, whatever. Uh, so this is something that I find a lot in composers like Louis Andreessen, uh, Michel van der Rahe, Marta and Padding, Plus de Vries, and so on. So um, I think that um, there is something that the more we listen and we get familiar to the music coming from different places, um, that um, emerges and uh, and reveals itself. Um, and uh, for me, as a, a radio author, it is a huge pleasure uh, to 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 uh, witness these these things happening. Um, another example, uh, uh, for example, 
even the power of landscape or nature, for example, uh, can be very strong in the music of composers, for, for example, from Iceland. I think uh, of the music of someone like Anna Thorvalds Dottir or Paul Ragnar Paulson. Uh, so uh, this, uh, when I say volcanic music, it's because I think that uh, when we are listening to the music of many of the Icelandic composers, for me as a foreigner, I strongly feel that sometimes I'm witnessing a landscape that is very unique. And I'm sure that it influences their minds as composers. Um, but uh, I also think that um, being outside of the phenomena, uh, it's very helpful uh, to identify these things. I find easy or easier to, ident uh, to, to ident uh, identify these things from the outside than if I would be from uh, the inside. Uh, I will quote a very wise sentence by my colleague Pedro Moreira that kindly started this session. He once told me that the secret for being able to eat cheese uh, is uh, and to avoid the feeling of the smell of the cheese is to be on the top of the cheese eating it. Uh, so if you are eating the cheese, you don't feel the smell. Uh, so sometimes this idea that uh, by being inside something, uh, it can be very powerful or very soft, whatever. But if we are inside, sometimes we actually don't notice things that well because we are too committed or probably we are part of, of the phenomena itself. Um, so getting back to the question that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I've as a composer, I felt that cheese problem when <laughs> When I was abroad, and uh, I was asked, "So, what is Portuguese in your music?" You know, and uh, um, I, I really couldn't answer. And uh, um, so, someone in the audience said, after listening to some examples, "Well, I, I think your music is clearly Southern European uh, because I find some melancholy or nostalgia in in your music." Uh, and for me, this was really um, striking because I didn't feel the music was melancholic or nostalgic at all. And I, I remember that probably this was like a, a cliche association. Uh, the person that said that, knowing that I was from the south of Europe, thought that, oh, it's the country of Fado. So he's truly uh, nostalgic, uh, you know? It's, so it's um, it's something that probably came, I thought by then, uh, as a cliche, uh, uh, something that by knowing the uh, geographic origin of someone, we automatically search for things that we would not search in other artists from other countries. Um, so, uh, Trying to answer to the question I raised as a subject for this uh, talk, uh, the artistic identity in current Portuguese music, I think it actually exists. Uh, I think it's diverse and I think it's uh, recommendable. Um, and um, I decided to share with you uh, some examples of uh, uh, composers uh, um, from a, a younger generation, uh, because I'm trying to show a bit of what is happening now in, in my own country. But I think it would be tedious to present a list of names uh, or to provide you a guide with the composers and different uh, trends um, with which they are associated. So I think it's um, uh, really the kind of approach I don't want to give you and also um, by showing you 10, 12, or 15 examples of different composers to make a, uh, to prove the idea of diversity, probably you wouldn't, you would not have the chance to taste uh, uh, anything of their music because 30 seconds or 40 seconds of music is really very little to to show whatever uh, uh, one wants to show. Uh, uh, so I prefer to present you a few examples of three young composers, as I said, who I think that achieved the individuality, um, despite the fact that the, um, uh, in some of their work, they, they can be associated with music that could be actually composed in other places and, and, and not necessarily in Portugal. 
so uh, I'm not trying to show you what is Portuguese in the music of these composers, but I'm trying to show you composers that I think that reached some uniqueness in the way they, they, they are composing. Uh, then, in the end, I will conclude sharing also um, uh, uh, an example of my own music, where I hope I also managed to express some individuality. Um, these examples, two of them actually refer to aspects that do not uh, uh, belong to what we would call Portuguese culture, and the other two, I think they are clearly uh, funded in something that we can call national. Uh, so I start with Sara Ross, and uh, Sara Ross actually she has this uh, um, uh, English name Ross uh, because she is actually daughter of two American musicians that came to Portugal uh, to play uh, in Portuguese orchestras. Sara's father is also a jazz musician, uh, um, and uh, so Sara was raised in the Azores. She has a very unique accent, a mix of American, Portuguese, and Azorian uh, accent. Uh, and uh, I think her music is a bit like that also. You, you can feel uh, the influence of uh, uh, jazz, classical music, but also traditional music uh, in uh, many of her works. Uh, the one I'm showing you is actually a song, a very beautiful song, um, sung by Maria João, who you will be able to listen today in the next session. Um, and uh, Sara wrote this song for uh, uh, the voice of Maria João and uh, a string quartet. Um, and uh, this string quartet, um, on the top of the string quartet, she also uh, used some electronics, uh, which create a very special uh, color and environment. Uh, Sara, about this piece, she says, I'm quoting, I wrote this song in one night. It's a very simple song. When I remember that, it makes me think when, for example, we have a contracture that when pressed strongly, there is that almost unbearable pain followed by a feeling of chemical and relaxing release throughout the body. It felt like this in a moment of emotional detachment. At the time, I also came up with a few words as a result of that moment but it was when I later found this poem by Keats that I felt um, I had found the remaining of the song. Uh, when dreaming, it wasn't difficult to have thought of Maria João. The word is authentic in her voice, its sweetness, its drama, its depth, its playfulness. So uh, I think Sara is finding a uniqueness uh, in this song um, in uh, uh, um, in a great part uh, through the voice of the soloist that she chooses to write for, but also through a very subtle and simple instrumentation uh, uh, that I mentioned before. So I propose we listen to this To Hope by Sara Ross.
Okay, so uh, I find it really a very beautiful song um, and uh, not necessarily Portuguese, but uh, with uh, an identity that we uh, are finding more and more in Sarah's uh, progress as a composer within the recent years. She was also a brilliant student here in our uh, Escola Superior de Musica. So was Pedro Lima, who I'm talking now about, and he's talking about his generation in the music that I'm going to share with you. Pedro was born in 1994, so he's the youngest composer I'm sharing with you today. Uh, and he was also um, a student here, as I said, and he went also to England to, to do his post-degree studies. And uh, he uh, eventually was invited by Casa da Musica in Porto to become uh, their young composer in residence. Uh, and one piece he wrote for the remix ensemble was this piece uh, for voice and ensemble and uh, pre-recorded sounds called Talking About My Generation. And um, the, the, the music uses uh, text um, written by a librettist, Gareth Matty, and uh, it has uh, a voice uh, of a British singer, Rose, Rose Stachinievska, who actually uh, reads the, 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 the text, but it's recorded, she's not on stage. Um, Pedro Lima himself uh, uh, defines this music uh, as uh, very dynamic with a lot of speed uh, and um, a fascination or delirium, if you like, for the chaos, for the chaotic observation that can be seen in various aspects of the contemporary world. So this is a piece that actually confronts us with a lot of things that uh, are very um, contemporary of um, the life of younger generations, these uh, speeds, this uh, dystopia, this sense of collapse, um, of um, disorder, uh, chaos uh, um, that I'm sure that um, many of uh, young uh, artists reflect in their own work. In their own work. Um, so uh, the, the musicians also interact in the performance, not only playing the instruments, but also shouting, uh, speaking, um, and um, sometimes they re react to the text. Uh, so uh, Pedro mentions that uh, it's not clear if uh, it is the voice of the speaker that uh, leads the uh, the ensemble or the other way around. So we are going, to, it's a long piece, so we cannot listen to the whole piece. We are going to listen to a section with the video that Pedro created, which is also a very fun video, as you'll see.
Okay, unfortunately, we have to interrupt because time is flying. I'm speaking more than I wanted to. Um, so the next example comes from Fatima Font. Fatima was born in 1983 and she did her studies in Porto, not in Lisbon, at the Porto College of Music. And then she went to Holland. And um, Fatima is very much uh, into studying um, um, ethnomusicology also, not only uh, music theory, but also the roots of Portuguese music from its uh, Arabic um, origins to, um, uh, she also went on, on, on a trip to, to India at a certain point. So she's very much uh, keen to discover um, music that comes from other tradition than the written tradition of uh, Western music. And um, when she was in Holland, uh, she did a piece for um, a festival that took place at the conservatory in Amsterdam. This was in 2012. And um, Fatima used um, uh, excerpts of uh, re research made by the musicologist, uh, the Corsican musicologist, musicologist Michel Jacobetti. During the 60s and the 70s, uh, he was uh, a, a key figure recording and filming a lot of um, tradition in popular music in Portugal, um, from uh, work songs to religious festivities, storytelling, many, many eth ethnographic material that we are happy to preserve and have with us, thanks to this uh, fantastic work by Michel Giacometti. And uh, Fatima used fragments of these um, films, um, and uh, but she did not make an arrangement of the, the melodies uh, uh, taken from that uh, material. She actually does a work that is halfway between music theater, uh, performance, uh, some choreographic elements, and she uses performance elements coming from the voice of the recordings that then she works in a different way. Uh, it's not an arrangement at all. It's something very personal, as you will be uh, able to see. In this performance, Fatima herself, she is on stage singing uh, with uh, uh, Laura Polans and Magdalena Golebiowska. Uh, so this is a piece only for three voices, um, but some moments within the performance includes the projection of fragments of the films made by Michel Giacometti. So let's see. The next example.
Well, um, and then um, the piece uh, goes on well, with uh, other fragments from these work songs. And then every time the three singers uh, sing on stage, there are elements that come from the, the coloristic effects of the traditional music, but that are um, composed or recomposed in a total different way, as you could see from this excerpt. I think also Fatima Fonti is one of our unique voices. Um, then I had also a fragment of uh, a piece I wrote uh, using uh, old recordings of Fado music, a piece that I called genetically modified fados because that's what actually what the, the music makes uh, it uh, genetically modifies very old recordings um, that i gathered from the fado museum uh, archive uh, but i'm going to skip that that bit uh, because i think it's time now to to discuss so if you have any interest you no no i'm not showing any of it <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. I, I think it it would it would make sense to show a little more. But if you are interested, the, the piece is on YouTube. It's called "Genetically Modified Fados," and then you'll see what I mean. But uh, I think now it's time to discuss. I'm going to put my headphones so it, that I can hear the questions, and uh, I also invite you to find more about uh, Sara, Pedro, and uh, Fatima's music. So. Thank you very much, Luisa. I'll start with some questions. Um, uh, well, despite the disclaimer you've made about uh, trying to uh, idealize the Portuguese uh, music, um, perhaps we might think of a different approach or a different uh, methodology for this. Instead of taking one composer or one piece and trying to find what's, what's, uh, what's Portuguese about it, which is obvious, obviously difficult. I understand perfectly the, meta the metaphor of the cheese, it's perfect. Uh, why not taking a, a set of pieces, for example, these pieces you've showed us today, and forgetting that at all that they are Portuguese, mm -hmm. forgetting they are same, they, they belong to the same geography, it's a word that you use often. Uh, is, is it still possible to identify some sort of a common ground, something uh, not even considering their Portuguese, you know what I mean? And the, perhaps after that, we can think what, what does it mean to be Portuguese music, but looking just for the music in, as itself, mm -hmm. do you think it's possible? Well, actually, um, because my, my concern was to uh, show music uh, written by composers that uh, are very different. Uh, with these pieces that I played, I don't think it is possible to find a common trend, trend between these three examples. Um, uh, I think that uh, if you ha have the interest to find more about um, these three composers, uh, for example, Fatima and uh, Sara, in a way, uh, there are works where uh, you, you, we can find more um, uh, points of contact. Um, namely, uh, Sarah is also interested in uh, music from uh, folk tradition, the, not only Portuguese folk tradition, but also, for example, from Brazil, popular music from Brazil. Uh, and um, uh, both are also interested in, in theater. Uh, they are in, interested in... Um, uh in 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 um, combining things coming from different sources uh, uh vocal music and and pedro in a way i think he's more focused in something that comes for a more pop culture but but of course he, he works this pop culture heritage in a very clever and uh uh skilled way uh, but um, one of the reasons why I like these composers and many other actually writing music in Portugal is that I think that they are different, uh, and uh, um, so I don't I don't find um, that we can put them together. Probably there is one thing that that unites them, not in the result, the artistic result of their music, but in their interest. They the, they are all three very much interested in stage music, for example. Um, uh, and in, in opera, uh, 
uh, all of them have been involved in workshops of writing for voices or writing chamber operas uh, uh, music theater fun. which is which is something that uh, I think that it's not to be neglected and I remember probably we we are from the same generation as composers and probably you will agree with me that uh, some years ago there was very much this tendency of uh, teaching composition uh, and not not I'm not referring to the school where we are in particular I'm speaking in in, in Portugal in general uh, that if we would get a very um, strong academic background and uh, if we would be trained in things that are very uh, uh, comproved uh, and by using these skills and these techniques automatically we would become skilled composers but we were not very stimulated to diversity to get out of this kind of box uh, so I think this generation these younger composers now they have a, a, a huge uh, freedom to, of course, learn the different traditions and the different techniques and what each school believes to be more or less interesting in the contemporary music scene. But at the same time, they are totally free to, I'm going to use the same word I used uh, a while ago, to, to be contaminated by things that can come from theater, from dance, from folk, from jazz, from rock, from Bach, <laughs> Boulez, whatever. So uh, this, this freedom, uh, is um, growing uh, this melting pot where you, you are very often surprised when you go to a, a new music concert and you find three, four, five different composers writing in a totally different way. So uh, this diversity is actually what defines the uniqueness of Portuguese music now, I think, which is a bit contradictory, I think. A different question, completely different. It's, well, it's uh, somehow related to what we are doing here, which is a webinar in Zoom. And uh, of course, this is due to, uh, to the pandemic situation we had before. Uh, I was wondering if you have any kind of insight about the youngest generation, because we, these composers you presented today are not old, but they are, well, uh, in the 20s, 30s. Yes. So. Uh, what, uh, what, how do you see the youngest generation in the, the, the 20s, in the 19s? Hmm. It's, it's, it's not easy because we are so close to <laughs> what's happening, but yes. uh, we've experienced a long period of, in this pandemic situation where the, we, have to, we have to do a lot of compromising in the, in the way people were studying and learning and, and the teaching was made. Mm -hmm. So what kind of wave shock do you feel from, from all that in the, this younger generation? So you want me to say that they are lazy? No, no, of course not. <laughs> no I'm, I'm, I think uh, what is implied in your question um, is something that uh, uh, I know what you think about that. I have the same feeling. And what can be done? What can be done? Yes, yes exactly. Uh, uh, for a start, I think we still have uh, much younger student composers that are extremely committed and they are almost obsessively involved in going to concerts, uh, concerts, reading scores, uh, learning music. Uh, uh, and this is good that we, we, we have the, an amount of students that do that. The sad part of the story is that they, these are not the majority. So many of them and I think the, the pandemic period uh, strengthened that uh, uh, danger that uh, people can be very uh, lazy at home uh, and uh, comfortable with uh, fast solutions that they found uh, and uh, decisions that they took and they take these procedures uh, as guaranteed. Um, so, for example, I normally warn them for the danger of becoming collectors. You know, it's... Uh, uh, without going into copyright issues, we all know that many young composers collect scores, I'm not going to say how, and recording, so they have these huge archives in their hard disks and their computers, and many times they don't listen to them, they don't read the, the, the music, and um, uh, so this this is something that we have to fight, um, also the the because when they listen, things are so easily accessible in their laptops, on YouTube, Spotify, or whatever, 
many of them are not going to concerts. They are not uh, enjoying the, the magic of listening to the music being played live, which it makes a total difference. And this is valid for Bach and for any living composer. Um, so in that sense, I think that um, you are right. The pandemic uh, reinforced this, this danger and it is our job as teachers to avoid or to warn them to the, to, to the dangers of that. On the top of that, and I think that leads us to a more kind of a genetic or chemical answer to your question. What I feel, for example, with my students is that the, those that are now in their 18, 19 years old, 20, um, their um, uh, speeds or their uh, need for speeds or for loudness is totally different from other generations. And I think this is very much affected by, by for example, the video gaming. Many, many of them spent many years playing video games or watching Marvel movies or whatever. And uh, so they get very bored and impatient when we uh, confront them with things that are um, calling for a slower pace of enjoyment of, uh, uh, of listening. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago, I had a student that was really enjoying the music that I was showing to him by uh, uh, Greek Cypriot composer Yanis Kyriakidis and um, he was telling me oh I love the music but I don't want to watch the video because the images being projected are very slow and this this kind of gave me an idea of how the speed in their brains uh, the chemical process in their brains is uh, really different and this is something that we as teachers also have to to be aware of and to learn how can we slow down their speed so to speak. Well, if I'm allowed to join in just with two very quick comments also, if Carlos lets me. Well, I would just like to remember that one, one of the five proposals by Calvino from the next millennium was speedness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. So, uh, um, Luis, um, first of all, uh, the, one of the problems of eating cheese is that they say that uh, it can affect your memory. And in fact, <laughs> I don't recall telling you that story. So maybe we have a problem here. Um, but secondly, think... secondly, like this is a kind of a personal view. It'll maybe a little provocation there also. And we all know about how important it is to develop a personal identity in this highly globalized world. And you need to find your voice in some way. Also in the jazz field where I come from, it's very crucial as an improviser and as a, 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 an overall musician. At the same time, um, I get a feeling that maybe in other um, periods, like, uh, and this is highly controversial, I'm aware of that, like if you take somebody like Bach of, or Mozart, I have this sense that in a way they just wrote music of their time and place. They weren't really necessarily obsessed of developing an individual expressive voice. Mm -hmm. In fact, Bach always said that it was in the name of God. So, uh, um, and in fact, what they did was, writing music of their time and place but in a much deeper way of course as as we hear it now after these years so my question is i know it's important i know we should go for it i know it's very uh, difficult to achieve it my question is do you think it's possible if you agree with this view that i'm sharing do you think it's possible to go back to that kind of innocence in making music without mm -hmm. having that obsession or that need I don't think it's an obsession nor need. I think it's a, a zeitgeist. It's a, you don't live in the in a period of um, uh, common practices. We you don't question uh, certain things when you live in a period, as you say, that you compose either for the church or for the king or the queen or uh, if you or or even. Uh, when when composers start uh, um, getting their egos to the foreground, we are not even there anymore. Uh, we are in um, a period where the multiplication of practices made totally impossible um, the, the the idea of having a common practice and that kind of purity. Uh, even you mentioned Bach, Bach to listen to the music of his colleagues. Sometimes he had to get a carriage and uh, do a journey of one, two weeks to get to a different village and, and town and listen to what was happening. 
today we just make sessions like these with people in different places in the world uh, talking at the same time and discussing or we, we could be listening music to music being done right now in the antipodes of the place where we are so these um as uh, um total absence of uh isolation unless you live in dicta dictatorial re regimes or whatever but if you live in democracy it's kind of a fatality in the good sense that you are totally overwhelmed by uh, 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 many, many things happening uh, 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 in every second. So by having this kind of tsunami of uh, feet, um, the, the, the question uh, emerges automatically. How can within this amount, this flow, this speed of uh, things happening at the same time, express myself without being caught by the, the tsunami. So it's, it's, it's totally a different context. We cannot compare. Uh, Bach probably would wake up and hear birds and uh, the bells in the church. We wake up and we listen to airplanes and motorcycles and uh, cell phones ringing. And so uh, our physical response to the creative process has to be totally different. And I'm sure very challenging, of course. I, I'm I'm afraid we're kind of running out of time because we have another session coming up. Maybe if somebody still has a very quick question or comment, um, let me check here to make sure that I'm not missing anybody. So um, maybe not. So um, if you agree, maybe we'll call it. So let me thank all of you uh, for joining us today in this session. And of course, especially Luis Tinoco, Carlos Caires, as well as Professor Sergio Henriques and his team, his students, Alexandre Furtado, David Pissarra, and Guilherme Franco from the Music Technology Department for their support and uh, um, uh, organizing technically all these uh, sessions. I would like to remind everybody that we have a, a, um, a session coming up in a few minutes with Maria Joao, and also that the Medina on Air session number four will take place from the 19th to the 26th of April. So thank you all very much and see you very soon. Thank you.